Good morning. This is uh, Passover Sunday. Passover, of course, was last week, uh, Tuesday. But uh, in keeping with our newfound tradition, uh, we'll celebrate the Passover over two Sundays. We'll have, uh, like we did last week, a teaching on the Passover. And then the week after Passover, we'll uh, do the Passover of Jesus, uh, where I'll try to add new things that I discover related to Jewish history and tradition uh, that uh, coordinate with Jesus' celebration of the last Passover. And then the second hour of today, we'll celebrate our Passover Seder uh, for the church, and we'll do an abbreviated version. And I'm working on that, refining it, and over the years, we'll actually get it down to a, to a quick little uh, salient service. But uh, today we'll begin with the Passover celebration uh, as celebrated by the Lord Jesus Christ at the last Passover Seder in the <coughs> upper room. So in order to begin that study, let's take a moment to uh, pray silently to utilize 1 John 1, 9 to confess any known sins. If, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us pray. Father, as we approach our study today and see the culmination of the entire plan that you had for us to be saved, to become your people, the entire plan for the Jews to realize their Messiah and to enter into their kingdom, for all of history focused on that one day, that one week, the Passover celebration and the Passover fulfillment. We thank you that you have made us your people and that we can study this in retrospect, not in anticipation of someday becoming your people, but in retrospect seeing that we have been made your people and we celebrate that fact. We thank you for all that you have done in the Lord Jesus Christ and we pray in his name, amen. We have looked at the uh, Last Supper uh, in past, uh, I think last year was our first year to look at it. And we're going to look at it again this year. The, uh, uh, a few new items entered in, as I try to do every year. Uh, it is agreed by all of Christendom that the Passover was completely fulfilled by Yeshua Messiah, the Passover Lamb. We can see the Messiah in all of the Passover Seder. We see the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, as John the Baptizer announced. We can see the parallels between the Passover in Egypt, when the Hebrews were passed over by the angel of death that struck the firstborn of Egypt. The Passover is the most important feast in all of, uh, of the Jewish calendar. Over a thousand years before, really 1,300 years before, when Moses and the twelve tribes of Israel found themselves in bondage down in Egypt, God called Moses from the burning bush and said, Go and tell Pharaoh the following, Israel is my firstborn son. Isn't that interesting that that's how, that's how uh, Moses was called to his mission. Is go tell, he didn't say from the movie version that we all know, don't go down and tell Moses, or go down Moses and tell Pharaoh to let my people go, but go tell him that, that Israel is my firstborn son. According to Jewish tradition, the exodus of the Hebrews from Egypt following the tenth and final plague took place on 15 Nisan, 2448 in the Jewish calendar, or March 25th, 1313 BCE, before the Common Era. Now that statement that uh, go tell Pharaoh that Israel is my firstborn is an interesting statement to begin with because the idea of a firstborn son is very essential to the Passover itself. Israel is my firstborn son and the firstborn son is the theme throughout the uh, entire Passover celebration that firstborn son plague 
the condemnation of all of the firstborn who did not have the blood of the Lamb, the firstborn of God, the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, did not uh, would fulfill that Lamb being the, uh, the firstborn. And it's as if God were saying uh, to Egypt and to all other nations, you are enslaving and ignoring and mistreating my firstborn nation, my firstborn son. Israel is my firstborn son. Go tell Pharaoh that Israel is my firstborn son. Firstborn son. Let him go to serve me or else I will slay your firstborn sons. It's the firstborn son throughout that whole uh, process and, and we see it even today, of course, in the fulfillment of the Passover. And you know the story about the plagues and how they came upon Egypt and Pharaoh kept hardening and turning away from God and wouldn't listen. Or he would listen and act like he was going to give in, but at the last minute he'd turn away and harden his heart some more. Until finally the tenth plague came, which was the plague of the angel of death, visiting death upon the firstborn sons in Egypt. Now notice I didn't say the firstborn sons of Egypt, because the, it was the firstborn sons in Egypt. It did not matter what your nationality was, if you were Jewish or Egyptian or any other nationality or belief system, if you did not have the blood of the lamb on the lintels and doorposts of your door, your firstborn son would die. So unbelieving Jews also would have their firstborn sons die during that Passover night plague. So the key again is faith. Faith. They had to believe that God would spare their children. If they didn't believe, they were not spared. It was not a system of works, putting that blood on the lamb, slaying the lamb, and then, and then putting the blood on the doorposts and lintel. It was not the works of that. It was the faith in believing what God had said that uh, was the key to the salvation of their firstborn sons. Even Egyptians, if Egyptians believed and put the blood on the doorposts and lintel of their home, the angel of death would pass over and their firstborn son would leave. And I, I have to believe that there had to be some who did believe that there were some actual Egyptian firstborn sons who were spared because of their belief in Jehovah God, the uh, God of the Israelites. All firstborn sons would have died, not just the Egyptian firstborn sons except for one thing, the Passover. If you and your household through the father, notice it was through the father, took a lamb and slew that lamb and sprinkled the blood on the doorpost and ate the meal, you would wake up and your firstborn son would be alive. Ravan Gamaliel, who taught Paul, used to say, Whosoever has not said the verses concerning these three things at Passover has not fulfilled his obligation. And these are they, Passover, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. Passover, because God passed over the houses of our fathers in Egypt and unleavened bread because our fathers were redeemed from Egypt and bitter herbs because the Egyptians embittered the lives of our fathers in Egypt. In every generation a man must so regard himself as if he came forth himself out of Egypt. For it is written, And thou shalt tell thy son in that day, saying, It is because of that which the Lord did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. When the Jews celebrate Passover, they celebrated as if they were the ones who were freed from the Egyptian slavery. It's personal to them, just as it's personal for us that we were set free from the, our bondage to the sin nature uh, when we were saved and we were passed over and received the blood of the Lamb and on our behalf. Therefore, Rabbi Gamaliel continues, Therefore are we bound to give thanks to praise, to glorify, to honor, to exalt, to extol, and to bless Him who wrought all these wonders for our fathers and for us. He brought us out from bondage to freedom, from sorrow to gladness, and from mourning to a festival day, and from darkness to great light, and from servitude to redemption. So let us say before Him the Hallelujah. Now we'll look at some isagogics at the time of the Last Passover Supper of Jesus. The, uh, we'll look at the factor of time and calendars. The Jewish evening always precedes the day. It's a very difficult concept. We talked about it last week. 
and it's still difficult. I, when I taught the Passover Seder uh, in uh, Harrodsburg this past week, that concept of getting the fact that the day begins at sundown the day before, uh, in our way of thinking, the day before. In the Jewish way of thinking, it's, that is the start of the day. But for us, since our day doesn't start until midnight, we tend to think of it as the day before. Sundown of Tuesday is the start of Wednesday. But to us, it's still the sundown of the day before Wednesday. But the Jews taught that the night began when three stars were visible in the sky at sunset, and therefore also the new 24-hour cycle began as we know it. So sundown of one day starts that day, and the principle goes back to the very beginning when we go back into Genesis to see that when God created the uh, recreated and renovated the heavens and the earth, it says that evening and morning were day one or day two, so we're one day. So it, it goes back to the fact that that's the way God set it up and the Jews have followed it and nobody else apparently does except the Jews. But it was evening and morning, so the evening began the day. That's why Sabbath, Shabbat, for the Jews begins on Friday evening because it's the seventh day, Saturday, that they're celebrating, but it begins at evening on the Friday, our day Friday, is their, the beginning of their Shabbat, their seventh day. Note also that each day and night period was always 12 hours long. That is, there were 12 divisions of the time period. Therefore, a six-hour daylight period, let's say in, the, the, in December, when we might only have six hours of daylight, that would still be divided into a 12, in quotes, hours, 12 divisions of the day. So each hour of the day would be 30 minutes long, in that case, in December. Now, in the middle of summer, when our days are long, and we might have 16 hours of daylight, then those hours, in quotes, hours, would be 90 minutes long to make up the, the uh, 16 hours into 12 time periods. So the seasonal variations in the length of, the, of daylight time made no difference to them because it was always divided up in that way. So that way you would know that the sixth hour, the ninth hour, the third hour, all of the hours were always the same in every day. So it's quite convenient for them. Uh, it's only in recent times that, and we've just talked about this in the past, it's only really with the establishment of railroad travel that standard time came into place where everyone was on the same time with the various time zones. So uh, there was no standard time back in the, the days of uh, the Lord or really up until the 1800s. The priests in the Sanhedrin followed a loony solar rabbinical calendar. We talked about this last week, but we'll review it a little bit here. The priests in the Sanhedrin followed a lunar solar calendar. It had lunar aspects and it had solar aspects. The Essenes, as we saw, on the other hand, adhered to a strictly solar calendar, uh, which, of course, when you have a solar calendar, you know you're going to have that 365.2 day cycle. That's the cycle of the earth around the sun. When you stick the moon in there, then you've got 28-day cycles that are mixed in, and, and that's what causes all the confusion with the Jewish calendar. But the Essenes stuck with a strictly solar calendar, and they, like we do, but they actually had a better version than we did, I think, uh, because their holidays always began not only on the same uh, date of the year, but the same day of the week. So, as I have taught you, then Thanksgiving for us is always on the same date, same day, <laughs> is always on the same day of the month, uh, but not the same date of the month, where Christmas is always on the same date of the month, but not the same day of the month. Their calendar was set up so that the day and the date for each holiday was always the same, and uh, so that way it was... You never had to wonder, uh, what, when's Christmas fall this year? When's, uh, what's the date of uh, Thanksgiving this year? 
You always knew the day and the date would be the same every year. So with the, with the Sanhedrin and the rabbis, uh, uh, the priests keeping one calendar and the Essenes keeping another calendar, and, that, and there were other calendars as well, but these are the two that are, are uh, uh, pertinent to our discussion. The, every year they would celebrate the Passover at a different date, a different time, because the Essene calendar might have the 15th of Nisan might be on uh, uh, March 31st, and the Jewish calendar might have the 15th of Nisan on April 8th. So there would be a difference. And sometimes they were close together, sometimes they would even uh, coincide precisely. Uh, they would never, according to rabbinical law, I believe, never actually be on the exact same day, because the... Uh, Essene calendar always had it Passover uh, began on Tuesday evening, where the Jews it could not uh, start on a Tuesday evening. So they kept the Passover at different times. The Essene calendar consisted of a solar calendar of 364 days, divided into seven-day weeks, 12 months of 30 days at each except for one extra day in the last month of each quarter. So that was more organized than us trying to remember 30 days has September, April, June. They, you just knew that every, every three months you had, uh, you had an extra day. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Feast of the Great Day, uh, which is the uh, eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, always began on Wednesday, which actually would be on Tuesday evening, since the Jews begin their days in the evening. By rabbinical rules, Passover Sabbath, starting at the previous sunset, can never occur on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. So that was the rabbinical rules. Not, not God's rules, but the rabbinical rules that they set up. Because they didn't want it to, to mess up other things. So they set those kind of rules up. So you see, the Essenes, it was, actually began on Tuesday evenings, on a Wednesday. The rabbinical rules prevented it from being on a Tuesday evening Wednesday. So that way they would never coincide exactly, which I think is interesting that it just happened to work out that way. In CE 30, however, the two calendars overlapped resulting in the two Passover celebrations occurring in the same week of April resulting in two Nisan 15 Passover celebrations occurring one day apart. The introduction to the Last Supper, leaven or chametz had to be gathered from the household so that the commandment of no leaven to be found in the house could be filled. And that goes all the way back to Exodus 12. In the Mishnah, the, the, the Jewish handbook of how uh, to fulfill what the Bible says, uh, Pesachim uh, 1a uh, reads that on the night of the 14th of Nisan, the chametz must be searched for by the light of a lamp. The practice, though this may have been a later addition, was to leave a piece of bread for the father to find, some kind of leaven for the father to find. And he used a feather and a wooden spoon, just as we show in our Passover celebration, to sweep them up, uh, put them in a linen cloth, and wrap them in this linen cloth and take them out and bury and, and burn them and bury it. And of course, the wooden spoon represents the cross. The, the feather uh, represents the Holy Spirit, uh, the feather of the dove, and, uh, and the light would uh, represent the light of the word, the candle that he used. So it was the three elements that we're aware of to, for finding sin in our lives, the candle, the light of the word, the Holy Spirit, the feather, and the spoon, the cross, are the means of dealing with sin in the life, removal of the chametz, the sin. And it was taken out and burned just as Jesus was, uh, was our burnt offering for sin. The collected heaven is burnt in the morning so that every house is cleansed throughout the land of Israel. And Pesachim 1.4 tells us that it was to be burnt at the sixth hour, the same time that uh, Jesus was staked out on the cross. The meal has come to be called the Seder, 
which means very simply order and represents the celebrations which took place on the evening of the 15th of Nisan after three stars were visible in the night sky. So this is when the sun would set between that time and the time that the uh, night that the three stars became visible was kind of in between time. Okay? And actually uh, one, they had another evening that they called it when the sun would begin to set after noon time. And that would be called one evening, and then the setting of the sun would be another evening, and the, the Passover was to be slain between the evenings, between the evenings. So noon to six would give us three o'clock in the afternoon was the time that that would take place. And there's, there's mention of that also in the scripture, between the evenings. And people who did not understand the Jewish way of calculating things would say, What's between the evenings? And they came up with all kinds of crazy ideas that it was the evening the night before and that evening, you know, they were trying to figure it out. So, and there are a lot of things that I probably don't know yet about all of that that we're going to try to add every year so that we have a clearer understanding because I think it helps us. All right, the order of the Last Supper begins with the Kiddush cup and uh, the uh, Kadesh or the Kiddush cup and uh, the Mishnah statement in Pesachim 10.2 says that the, after they have mixed him the first cup, he says the benediction, the blessing. And the word Kadesh or Kiddush is the, means consecration and refers to the blessing of uh, the first cup of wine, the cup of thanksgiving. In Luke 22.14-16, through 16, we see the Kiddush cup in the Passover celebration called the Last Supper. And when the hour came, he reclined at tables, and the, at ta he reclined at table. He didn't recline at table, that's the, uh, the uh, at table is added there, but he reclined at the rug, actually, where they would all lay around like, like a wheel, the spokes of a wheel with a central rug where the food was. And that's how you have that idea of he who reclined, the one who reclined at Jesus' breast, right? And so they have these pictures. Michelangelo wasn't there, by the way, to uh, know how to paint these pictures of the Last Supper scene. And so it wasn't that somebody, that they were sitting next to each other on this big, long uh, dais-type table, you know, big, long head table, and somebody leaned over like this to, to talk to Jesus. It wasn't that at all. You were lying on your side, and uh, like the spokes of a wheel, so you were, your back was to the person uh, next to you, and you were facing the next person's back around the wheel. So the person who was reclining at Jesus' breast was the one in front of him so that he would lean back over to talk to the Lord. And that's how they ate back then. So he reclined with the apostles, and he said to them, with an intense desire, I desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now notice the 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 emphasis that Jesus puts on this in the Greek. With an intense desire, I desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will positively not any longer eat the same until the time when it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And having taken a cup, having given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. This is the cup of thanksgiving. This is the Kiddush, uh, the Kaddish or the Kiddush cup, the cup of thanksgiving. So we have the first cup of the Jewish ceremony is celebrated by the Lord. Then we have the Rahaz, the washing, and this is the first of two washings. Uh, Jesus took a long linen cloth, a lentium, uh, lention in the, in the Greek and lentium in the, in the Latin, and tied it around his middle so that with the end of this towel he would be able to dry the disciples' feet after he had washed them with his hands. Uh, truly the Lord of glory, then, as it says in 1 Peter 5, 5, had, had girded himself with humility because this washing was the role of a slave to do. The slaves would do the washing, not, not the host of the feast or the guest of honor of the feast, but a slave would do the washing. <coughs> Pardon me. Then he poured water in the wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to dry them with a towel which was tied around his waist. Peter protested, and Jesus said to him, He who is bathed has no need of washing anything uh, except his feet, 
but is clean altogether. And you are clean, but not all of you are. For he knew the one who was betraying him, and it was for this reason that he said, not all of you are clean. Now remember when we studied the tabernacle? And we studied, studied the labor? And when a, when a priest, a new priest began his service, what did they do? They washed him, the other priests washed him from head to toe. He was bathed. Right. Then when he would perform the sacrifices, he would go to the laver and wash his feet and hands. But he didn't have to be bathed again in order to do that because the first washing speaks of salvation. The washing by the Holy Spirit, the washing of regeneration where we are cleansed of our dependence on our sin nature and given our new nature and regeneration where we are a new creation, a new being. So that's, this first washing speaks of that. So you notice that Jesus says here, he who is bathed needs not wash anything except his feet. You don't have to take another bath if you're already clean. You've been walking out, all you have to do is wash your feet. You've been walking through the dirty streets, you just wash your feet. And that refers to that cleansing that we continue to go through, the washing at the laver, the washing of 1 John 1, 9. Now we'll actually see the washing of 1 John 1, 9 come up when, the, when we have the second washing, which is now the tradition in the, among the Jews and the Passover now is to have two washings. But this is the Rehaz, the washing. Of course, who was not clean? Who was the one that was not clean? Why wasn't he bathed? Why wasn't he clean? He didn't believe. He didn't believe. He had never been washed because he never believed. The next point of similarity with the Mishnah is in Pesachim 10.3 where it is written, when food is brought before him, he eats it with lettuce until he has come to the breaking of bread. This is what the Pesachim the, the, uh, from the Mishnah says about the karpas, the green herbs. Now we celebrate karpas today with the parsley. But back in the, in the days of the early church and the Jewish times, before and after the coming of the Lord, they had finger foods that were wrapped in lettuce. Right? And so they would eat that as kind of their appetizers before the main meal. And so that's really where the greens, the idea of the greens came from. And you would eat it until time to break the bread. And then with the breaking of bread, that was the end of hors d'oeuvres. That was the end of the, of the appetizer. Today, carpus is the act of dipping a green vegetable into some salt water and then eating it. But in the Mishnah, the ceremony doesn't appear in this form. The Mishnah at this point is only saying that food was eaten before the lamb was and that when it was, it should always be eaten with lettuce. Matthew 26, 20 through 25 tells us that Jesus said at this point, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. So when they would take the lettuce and dip it in and get out the whatever the mixture was that they were eating, uh, this is the point at which Jesus said, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. Well, of course, they all thought, well, everyone's dipping in the dish. See, they didn't quite understand who it was that it was at that moment that when, Je when Judas dipped with him. Jesus' words refer back to Psalm 41.9, uh, where David wrote, even my closest friend in whom I have trusted, who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me to show the fulfillment of the Old Testament scripture and interpreting it, it means simply one who has shared fellowship with me has or will betray me or has betrayed me. So that is a fulfillment of Psalms 41.9. He, uh, even my friend who has dipped with me or eaten uh, my bread uh, will betray me. There's no positive identification of the betrayer at this point. Jesus is only saying that one of those present who's eating food with him would be the one who was to betray him. Note that the 11 disciples question him with, Is it I, Lord? But one of them, Judas, says, Is it I, Rabbi? Okay. He does not call him Lord, but he calls him Teacher. Is it I, Teacher? So you can see immediately it's pretty obvious who it is. 
the one who doesn't call Jesus Lord. The title rabbi was used of any Jewish teacher and means something like my master. In this context, however, the reason why Judas uses it is probably more as a token of respect rather than to indicate the idea of lordship or supremacy over another to the point of submission and obedience. Though he could not bring himself to say, uh, is it I, Lord, like the others were able to do, but he had to say, is it I, Rabbi? It's difficult to escape the submission obedience aspect of the disciples' Lord, however, and it may even be a halfway between recognizing Jesus as their leader and their God. Jesus' words to Judas, you have said so, are the same as if he had said yes, as can be seen from his confession before Caiaphas a few hours later in Matthew 26, 64. You have said so is an affirmation that what you have said is true. But it's not certain that the disciples would have heard it or understood it had they done so. They may even have thought of such a statement as being something which lay far into the future or that wasn't as serious as it might be. After all, Jesus was one of them. They did not have that concept. If, if we were all sitting here and, and I knew that one of you was a bad guy and you knew that you were a bad guy, uh, Judas, did I say okay, Judas? And uh, if I were to say certain things between you and I, we would understand what we were talking about, but the other people wouldn't because they weren't in on the secret. So that's kind of what's going on here at the Last Supper between Jesus and Judas. The breaking of the matzah, uh, the unleavened bread, after the preliminary eating that eating with the greens. Uh, Pesachim 10.3 carries on by noting that it, uh, this was to continue until he has come to the breaking of the bread. And today, three pieces of matzah, uh, unleavened bread, are used at different points in the Seder. It was broken and passed around to all the participants, and the scripture says that it was as they were eating, which refers us back to the discussion of the ceremony under the carpus, that Jesus took the bread, which would have been, of course, unleavened. During the initial eating from the common food bowl, then Jesus took the bread that was the next step in the correct Paschal procedure. Paschal is Passover. Jesus gave thanks for it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, drawing out the truth that from that time onwards they were to think of his body as broken for them. Today the afikoman is celebrated with half of this breaking of the matzah. So we'll see that when we do our celebration next hour. Next in the procedure was that which is recorded in Pesachim 10.3 that instructs the reader that they bring before him unleavened bread and bitter herbs and harosa. Bitter herbs are taken into an unleavened bread sandwich using the broken pieces of the unleavened bread and dipped into the harosa, an apple, nut, cinnamon, honey, and wine mixture, uh, depending on the recipe, uh, and then eaten. It's called dipping the sop in the, in the King James Version. The bitter herbs are called the maror. They bring tears to the eyes as a reminder that the Israelites' bondage to the Egyptians was bitter. The haroseth is a reminder of the clay bricks that the Egyptians were forced to make uh, because of its appearance. And though whether this last point was in their minds in the first century isn't certain, even though it remains more than likely. They're pretty certain that that was what they were doing there, was this concept of the bricks, that there was sweet stuff that was part of this uh, celebration. Notice that uh, Jesus was troubled in spirit when he dipped this, uh, the bitter herbs. And uh, watch in John 13, 21, where it says, After saying this, Yeshua, in deep anguish of spirit, declared, Yes, indeed, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The bitterness of the herbs reflected the sorrow of knowing that Jesus had not, or Judas had not believed in him and he would betray him. He would betray Jesus. John 13, 21 through 30 is the full text. After saying this, Yeshua, in deep anguish of spirit, declared, Yes, indeed, I tell you that one of you will betray me. The Talmudim stared at one another, totally mystified. Talmudim are the disciples. Uh, they were totally mystified. Whom could he mean? One of his Talmudim, the one Yeshua particularly loved, John, was reclining close beside him. 
So uh, Shimon Kepha, Peter, Simon Peter, motioned to him and said, Ask him which one he's talking about. Leaning against Yeshua's chest, he asked Yeshua, Lord, who is it? Right? He's kind of laying back over. He's, Lord, who is it? Yeshua answered, It's the one to whom I give this piece of matzah after I dip it in the dish. So he dips the bitter herbs and the harosif uh, with his matzah and he gives it to Judas. So he dipped the piece of matzah and gave it to Yehuda ben Shimon from Kriat. Okay, that's Judas ben from Shimon, his father, Simon, from Kriat, where we get Judas Iscariot. Okay, that's where we get Judas Iscariot. This is the literal Hebrew translation, Yehuda ben Shimon from Kriat. Uh, as soon as Yehuda took the piece of matzah, the adversary went into him. Jesus then said, what you are doing, get it over with. But no one at the table understood why he had said this to him. Some thought that since Yehuda was in charge of the common purse, he was the treasurer of the group. Yeshua was telling him, buy what we need for the festival, or telling him to give something to the poor. As soon as he had taken the piece of matzah, Yehuda went out, and it was night. Okay? There we have that calendar thing again. We went from sundown okay, to the three, when the three stars come out, now it's night. Okay, you have that in-between period where, where we would call it dusk, okay, and, and uh, then you have the night. So we have a concept here uh, that the Holy Spirit is very careful to let us know how time is proceeding here. Throughout this, it's not just haphazard uh, that we would throw in, oh, and it was night. No, there was a reason for it, and it was to keep track of time, as we'll see as we go on. Immediately after receiving the morsel, Judas left the Passover feast and went to the high priest to pass on Jesus' whereabouts. Okay. What actually happened during that meeting is impossible to know, but we may judge based on the likelihood of, Jesus's, of Judas' return uh, to the meal later. Okay. because Judas leaves here. And this is one of the things that people talk about uh, with the Bible isn't accurate in the Gospels because you have Judas being told at two different times to do what he's going to do. When actually it's because Judas was told this, he left, went and met with the, with the priests to set it all up, and then they said, well, go back. We're presuming that this is what they said based on what happened. Go back and find out where he's going when he leaves. We don't want to burst into this upper room where all these people are. Well, we'll get him when he leaves. And, then, and so Judas went back again to the Passover and has missed part of it, actually like a couple of hours that have gone by since before Judas comes back. The high priest likely gave instructions to Judas to return to the meal and inform him when the meal was completed so that an arrest might be made at that point. It would be the case then that after he discovered where they were going, Judas slipped away from the crowd bound for the other side of the Garden of Gethsemane to meet with the prepared soldiers who were awaiting his return to lead them to where Jesus was. John 13, 23 refers to the seating arrangement when it comments that one of his disciples was reclining close to the breast of Jesus. Each participant would be lying with their feet furthest from the table, uh, a rug uh, spread on the floor on which the food was placed, while they supported themselves with one of their arms. This meant they would, in effect, all face the back of someone so that the one immediately in front of Jesus, John, would be the one who was lying close to his breast. This is not how it looked. This, this is even, and this is actually, you see, the official pronouncement there that this is a Christian Seder. This isn't even the Jewish uh, uh, Seder. This is a uh, Christian Seder pronouncement where they were all at table, uh, at a table as opposed to lying on the floor. Bethlehem 10.4 uh, then instructs us about the second cup. They then mixed him the second cup, known as the cup of bondage, also known as the cup of plagues, 
and it's also known as the cup of instruction. And it continues uh, that, here the son asked the father, and these are the four questions. And this is why it's called the cup of instruction, uh, because there are four questions asked by the son here. He says, why is this night different from other nights? For on other nights we eat uh, seasoned food w once, but this night twice, and this would be the carpus and the moror, or the uh, korek, the sandwich. On the other nights we eat leavened or unleavened bread, but this night all is unleavened. On other nights we eat flesh roasted, stewed or cooked, but this night all of it is roasted. Now those are the ancient four questions. They've been changed somewhat. Now, the, because they don't eat roast anything, they're not allowed to eat anything roasted now, the Jews are not, uh, because of the fact that the temple has been destroyed, as Jesus predicted, for their failure to accept him as their king. The, he gave them one generation to, to change their mind, repent, and believe in him. And then at the end of that generation, in 70 A.D., then the temple was destroyed, so there would be no more temple sacrifice. There would be no more lamb slain, there would be no celebration of the Passover with a Passover lamb anymore. So they don't ask this flesh roast question anymore. Now it's uh, why, let's see, uh, why do we, so, uh, on other nights we may eat sitting or reclining, but on this night we only recline. That's the, the new question that they ask instead. To these four questions, a very lengthy teaching is provided by the Father. This is called the Magid, who goes through the story of the Exodus in intricate detail, especially the plagues. I mean, they spend an hour or two going through this whole Passover, telling it, reading it, and then explaining it. Uh, all of Jesus' re teachings recorded for us in the Gospel of John at the Last Supper occurred, not, not probably, but did occur at this point in the proceeding. You have what's called the upper room discourse. If you go, if you have in traditional churches, that's one of the, one of the, uh, every year they'll do a sermon on the upper room discourse. It's where all the teaching took place. Probably the primary one that uh, we all recall that took place in that upper room discourse is when he said, by this they will know that you are my disciples if you keep on loving one another. That was part of that Upper Room Discourse. It was quite long. There's a lot to the Upper Room Discourse, and we may study it sometime to, uh, in the context here of the last Passover Seder when I add some new things and leave out some things that we've covered in the, in the past. So we may go through that Upper Room Discourse. But that was when the teaching took place because that was the cup of instruction. Right? That's when the, 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 the learning took place because Seder isn't just uh, a meal. It's a teaching. It is Bible study. Seder is also Bible study to learn. That's when the children would first be introduced to Bible study in the, about Exodus and the adults would learn from the teaching of the Father. Uh, everything would take place there. They would all be learning Bible study. At the end of the teaching, the second cup of wine was dripped out to commemorate the ten plagues. Then the first part of the Hallel, the little Hallel, is sung and the Hallel being Psalms 113 through 118 of the Old Testament, and the little Hallel is Psalm 113. So they divide the Hallel into two parts, the little Hallel and the great Hallel. The little Hallel is Psalm 113, the great Hallel is 114 through 116, and at the second cup, when they drip out the ten drops of the wine to commemorate the ten plagues, then they would sing the little Hallel. There is no mention of the second cup in the last Passover. We have the first cup, the cup of thanksgiving. We have the breaking of the bread. We have the carpus and the harosif, the, the dipping. We have that. And then we have the meal. And then we have the breaking of the afikomen. The, and then we have the third cup that's drunk. But we have no second cup. The second cup is left out. And it was the, the cup that commemorated the ten plagues with the ten drops of wine that were dripped out. Although it's not clear when the lamb and dinner was eaten according to the Mishnah, it's likely that it was at this point because it's most fitting because of uh, today's celebration that they put away uh, the Seder plates and then they bring out the shank bone of the lamb 
and the roasted egg to commemorate the lamb when the lamb would be eaten. Uh, this is the dinner itself is called the Shulhan Orech, and it's the dinner. These uh, today serve as reminders of the lamb that used to be eaten by the Orthodox Jews, but which can no longer be done until the temple is again functioning. So the, the egg and the shank bone are always on the Seder plates, and they are to commemorate the fact that there is no lamb eaten. No lamb eaten today because the temple is out of commission. It's been destroyed, and they, of course, await to its rebuilding so that they can then do the Passover lamb celebration again. Next, after eating dinner, the other half of the matzah, the part hidden away in a linen burial cloth, is searched for, brought forth, and eaten. This is called the afi komen. It's the bringing forth. It's Greek. It's not, uh, not a Hebrew word. It's a Greek word. This is the bread broken for us to represent the sacrifice of his sinless body, commemorating the fact that he had no sin nature and no personal sin in his body. Fesahim 10.7 then records the third cup, the barak, is brought forth, and barak means grace. Right? It's grace. Before grace is declared, the third cup is poured. This is the cup after supper, and it's called the cup of redemption. Third cup, Jesus drank that. This is, the, this is my blood, and it's the blood of the new covenant, or the, the uh, we'll see what the real words were coming up, but this is the cup of redemption. Then grace is uh, said, and all drink from the third cup. In uh, Mark, Luke, and Matthew, it's recorded that he took this cup and after having said grace over it, revealed its significance as the redemptive act that he was about to perform for all mankind on the cross. The wine represented the blood that was to be poured out for all men to redeem them from slavery. Luke 22, 21 indicates that Judas returned to the meal at this point in the proceedings, having gone to the chief priest to secure the band of soldiers, most likely Judas returned because of the likely instruction he'd received at the house of the high priest. Jesus is recorded as saying that the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. This is that second reference now that Judas, and that's why people say, well, see, it says that Judas left, but then it says that his hand is with him at the table later. So the Bible can't be accurate. No, it's that their understanding of the events is not accurate. Jesus is probably confirming John's understanding of his earlier identification. He's probably telling John, John, the hand of him who betrays me is at the table again. He's back again. While this is certainly not the traditional interpretation and, and may not be correct, but it seems, to take, uh, Jesus, it seems difficult to take Jesus' words in Luke as meaning anything else. Between one and two hours have elapsed. Sufficient time for Judas to have left, met with the high priest, and to have returned. Judas was therefore gone during the teaching of the eleven that occurred earlier in the Lord's Supper portion of the celebration. Now, the first cup of the blessing of the festival today is called the Kiddush cup, cup of thanksgiving. It goes all the way back to the time of Exodus. The second cup of wine occurs really at the beginning of the Passover liturgy itself and involves the singing of Psalm 113, the little Hillel. And then there's the third cup, the cup of blessing, which involves the actual meal, the unleavened bread, and so on. And then before the fourth cup, you sing the great Hallel Psalms, 114 through 118. That's the great Hallel. And having sung those psalms, you proceed to the fourth cup, which for all practical purposes is the climax of the Passover, that last cup, the fourth cup. When blessing the third cup, Jesus says, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until it is completed in the kingdom of God. And it then says, and then they sang psalms. Well, every Jew who knows the liturgy would expect, and then they went ahead and said the grace and the blessing and had the fourth cup, which climaxed and consummated the Passover. That would be what would normally happen. But no, the gospel accounts say that they sang psalms and went out into the night with no mention of the fourth cup. So we have earlier no mention of the second cup, and now we have no mention of the fourth cup. They drink the Hallel, that's the hymn. They sang psalms and went out into the night. They sang the great Hallel, and then they left. No mention of drinking the fourth cup. So we have two cups now that are missing. And here's, the, uh, here's the text. 
And while they were eating, he took a matzah, praised God, and gave thanks, and asked him to bless it to their use. Then he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He also took a cup of the juice of grapes, the wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank it. And he said to them, This is my blood, which ratifies the new covenant, the blood which is being poured out for her on account of many. Solemnly and surely I tell you, I shall not again drink of the fruit of the vine till that day when I drink of it anew and in a new and higher quality in God's kingdom. That's the expanded translation of that. I will not drink of it until it, except in a new and higher quality in God's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So we have this third cup, him saying, I'm not going to drink anymore until it's, until it's completed, until I, until I drink of it in a new and a higher quality of fulfillment in the new kingdom, in God's kingdom. Then the fourth cup is poured after the Hallel, Pesachim 10.7 says, and then he completes the Hallel, the fourth cup is filled and the remaining psalms of the, sung are, uh, of the Hallel are sung. And then they all drink of the fourth cup, which is called the cup of completion. However, Matthew 26, 30 and, Ma and Mark 14, 26 report that they went out towards Gethsemane when they had hymned, referring to this part of the ceremony, without mention of the fourth cup, the cup of completion. And Pesachim 10, 9 says, uh, notes that after midnight, the Passover offering renders the hands unclean. That is to say, Passover celebrations had to be completed before midnight. Right? Had to be completed before midnight. We know, therefore, that the meal finished before this time and that they would have been in Gethsemane, certainly around midnight, with the likelihood being that they probably arrived there before that time rather than after. So just before midnight, they got to Gethsemane. The Lord takes them across the Kidron Valley to Gethsemane, a garden located at the base of the Mount of Olives, and there's the Kidron, uh, where they were, they were in the upper city, and so they have gone uh, from the upper city down over here to this Kidron, across the Kidron here, the Kidron is the river, and to the Kidron Valley, to the base of the Mount of Olives. In the book of Exodus, the Lord announces His plan originating the titles given to the four cups. This is from Exodus 6, 6 through 8. This is where the four cups come from. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, and I will bring you in unto the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for a heritage. I am the Lord. So this is where the, the four cups got their name, from the I will bring you out, I will rid you out of their bondage, I will redeem you, and I will take you you to be my people. The titles of the four cups, taken as they are from the Lord's own words in Exodus, are nothing less than a progressive four-step prophecy of his intentions, not for the rehearsal, but for the true Passover. Remember, all of the words for these feasts of Israel are the word for rehearsals, not for the actual event. The first cup, the cup of, a cup of sanctification, I will set you out. I will set you apart. Sanctified means set apart. The cup of bondage, the second cup, I will rid you out of bondage. That's why it's called the cup of bondage and the cup of plagues, because the plagues were the Egyptians' punishment for that, for that bondage. The third cup, the cup of redemption, I will redeem you, I will pay for you. And the fourth cup, the cup of completion, I will take you to me for a people. So it's called the cup of acceptance and the cup of completion, where that process is completed. The fourth cup satisfies the four steps in that process. We have noted that the pouring of drops of the second cup 
and the drinking of the fourth cup were not reported in the last Passover accounts in the Gospels. Was this an oversight by the Holy Spirit-inspired writers, or did Jesus omit their performance for a special reason? Luke 22, 42 through 44, from the New Living Translation with some minor corrections. In Gethsemane, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup away from me. Yet I want your will, not mine. Now what is the usual teaching related to that statement by Jesus to take this cup away from me? If I don't have to go to the cross, uh, I don't want to, but if it's your will, I'll go ahead and do it. Uh, well, it's actually more specific than that. It is partially that, but it's more specific than that. This cup that he's talking about is that missing second cup because he is fulfilling it now. Let's look at the scripture, the rest of the scripture, to see how that happens. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently and he was in such agony of spirit, his sweat fell to the ground like great clots of blood. Now what happened with the second cup? You take your finger and you dip out the wine and you drip it onto the ground. Now we dip it onto a plate because we don't want to get, the, get red wine all over the, the carpet. But, but the, that, the Jews would take the drops of blood and drip them onto the ground because that was the cup of bondage. Well, what was Jesus getting ready to do? He was getting ready to take upon himself from the sixth to the ninth hour the bondage of sin on our behalf. Our sins were going to be placed on him. And that's where the bondage, the drops would come out here with this. This is the fulfillment of the second cup in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was suffering knowing what he was going to do, what he was going to have to suffer for our sin. The cups that Jesus blessed and distributed are identified as the first cup, the cup of thanksgiving, the third cup, the cup of redemption. We've now seen that the second cup uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the cup of bondage, fulfilled during the sixth to the ninth hours on the cross. And we look through the Gospels, Jesus also skips the drinking of the fourth cup during the course of the Passover meal. Here is the fourth cup fulfillment. John 19, 28 through 30. The cross at the ninth hour. Jesus, seeing that everything had been completed so that the scripture record might also be complete, then said, I'm thirsty. A jug of sour wine was standing by. Someone put a hyssop sponge soaked with the wine on a javelin and lifted it to his mouth. After he took the wine, Jesus said, It's done, complete. Bowing his head, he offered up his spirit. I see? Third cup, what did he say? I will not drink this cup again until it has been completed in the kingdom. Now remember, on his way to be crucified, Someone offered him wine. They offered him wine to drink, and he rejected it. Because why? It had not yet been completed. So this is the completion. And now what does this cup, fourth cup, do? I will make you my people. See, we weren't qualified to be his people until he had done everything, until he had completed everything. Tetelestai. It is completed. And so this is the fulfillment of that fourth cup. The fourth cup that Jesus drank to signify the completion of the real Passover, not the rehearsals that the Jews had celebrated up to that time, celebrating the Passover supper. The cup that concluded the process and made us his people. Yes. Of the 
of God's relationship with the church? Well, with all people. With all people. Sure, with all people, yeah. Because everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek, you know, it doesn't matter who you are if you believe, and that was the process. I will, I will sanctify you, I'll set you apart, I'll, re- I'll, I'll rid you out of the bondage of the sin nature, I'll redeem you, I'll pay for you, and then I will make you my people. So it's, it was for anyone, for the Jews as a nation, for us as individual people, as, as Gentiles and Jews. Jews will become part of the church. So it's that, of course, we had the, the Israel era, the Israel era set aside at 70 A.D., the completion of the body of Christ, the people of his family. The Jews are God's people. They're not God's family. They're God's people. The church is God's family. And then when the family is complete, the body of Christ is complete, when the last Gentile believer believes, then the body will be complete, and then that will begin then the Jewish age again, the 70th week of Daniel. That 70th week, that last seven years period of time for the, for the establishment of the kingdom of the Jews. And then the millennium, the kingdom, takes place. Okay? So that's, that's for everyone. But that's the process that he goes through. He sets us apart. Then he, he rids us of bondage and he redeems us and then he makes us his people. Let us pray. Father, we are so grateful for that process that you have applied to each of our lives as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ as those who have faith alone in Christ alone, understanding that He is the way, the truth, and the life. We thank You that You have given us this Passover season so that people throughout the world, both believers and unbelievers, Jews who do not know the Messiah, celebrate this season so that they might see Him. And we pray for those who have celebrated this past week who have seen the Passover Seder, will now see the fulfillment of the Passover Seder in the Lord Jesus Christ, so that they might come to faith in Him, realize their Messiah, and become part of His body, becoming one of His people. We thank You that You have done it all, that it is perfect, and that it is beautiful in the way You have done it all. We thank You in the name of the One who completed the process and made us Your people our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.